This is the second and last video covering early Windows games for 1994, and I've managed to find quite a wide selection of different titles. I hope you like them. And what's important here is that the next will start covering games from 1995, which will allow us to see even more better games. So let's not waste any more time here and see what's in the store for today. Legions is a top-down turn-based historical strategy set between ancient and early medieval times. I wouldn't have used it as background to teach history because of many inaccuracies. Economic and tactical layers are fine though, so if you're not in it for history, you should be fine. There are quite a few scenarios to choose from happening over that period and plethora of various era-appropriate units available. In Legion, you're also responsible for diplomacy. That said, it's a mess. I can't for the life of me tell why, when and how certain wars start and what the AI wants from me and what to do to keep them happy and plan out alliances or wars. In fact, it's as probable to have AI offer an alliance as it is to have it declare war on you, seemingly for no reason. While the graphics are not great, they're readable and that's pretty much all you can hope for in a strategy. Would I like presentation to be more flashy, colorful and perhaps even 3D? Sure, but lack of fireworks and simplistic graphics are definitely not something that should deter you from playing. Especially that after a while graphics tend to grow on you and you stop noticing them. To summarize, Legions is an interesting but flawed game that only hardcore fans of turn-based strategy genre should seek out and only if they have nothing else on their platters. Others would do themselves a favor by trying other better games, like Civilization we spoke about in the last video, for instance. Before I say anything more, please note that Lunicus is a Macintosh original that was converted to Windows. Why is that important? It's not, but it's worth noting as we will see a few more of this in the coming videos. Anyway, Lunicus is a first-person perspective shooter in which you have to defeat the aliens that attacked and ravaged the Earth and finally free the planet from their slimy grasp. How do I know that it's slimy? I don't, I assume, I'm a bit prejudiced against those who attack us for no reason. Another question that comes to mind is why is it you again who has to save the world? And while I understand that you may be tired of being our first and last line of defense combined into one, you do know that there's no one else, right? No one else can do it. Not even Batman. Especially not him, he can't even save a Snickers bar from its wrapper. I just saw him yesterday trying to open one and dropping it to the floor. It didn't stop him from eating it though. So, you'll be running series of missions in various areas all over the Earth, dropping down from our Mars base and fighting to regain the Earth and rid it of the alien scum. While doing so and progressing within the game, you'll eventually have to defend your base and at the very end, defeat the aliens at their own mothership. As FPS games go, Lucinus is an average game at best, it features decent but rather unimpressive graphics and appropriate sound design. By 1994, however, we had many more better FPS titles available on PC already, just running under DOS. So if Windows is your classic platform of choice, or the only one you have access to, which would be odd as by then it was just a graphical add-on on DOS, then sure, Lunicus is not the worst choice. It's worth noting that there's quite a few cutscenes during gameplay, and while they're a bit blocky, they do add to atmosphere of you being Earth's last hope of saving it. MAD, so Mutual Assured Destruction Fury, states that the atomic weaponry is so devastating and present in such large quantities around the world that if used by one state, it would have triggered counter-response from others and that would start chain launches all around, that would ultimately destroy the world. The Fury does not take crazy leaders under consideration, but whatever, it's just a Fury. Anyway, Metal Marines depicts a similar but slightly modified situation and tells a story of Earth that in a similar chain of events was mostly destroyed by the Antimatter Wars and is now left in ruin recovering in small pockets where life can still be sustained with former continents scorched and reduced to series of smaller habitable islands. Earth as is is under control of despotic ruler, the so-called Zorgiv the Great, who considers it his own empire. Similar to previous game in this video, your base, from which you try to free and reclaim the Earth, is in space. This time a bit closer though, in orbit. And you're the one tasked with defeating Zorgiv. In Metal Marines' future, however, after destruction brought by the antimatter weaponry, given how few people are left alive, wars and battles are not waged with countless infantry anymore. They're either fought at distance with use of rockets, missiles and such, or with huge 50 feet tall mechs, the titular metal marines, that are used both offensively and defensively. The game is a real-time strategy in which you're wagering campaign to reclaim all islands from Zorgiv's grasp, defeating his lieutenants on each and every one of these and finally overthrowing the overlord himself. On each map you place three underground bases, erect buildings used for warfare, economically or for production of units and try to conquer the island you're on before all of your bases are destroyed. 
Metal Marines themselves are largely independent. When deployed, they attack the nearest targets in range and all you can realistically do is to send them in particular direction. I realize that my description here may be faulty at best and, and incomprehensible at worst, but one thing should be made clear. Metal Marines is really fun if you like the genre, and especially those sci-fi post-apo strategies. So if you do, it's definitely not the title to sleep on. It is worth pointing out though that the game is incredibly demanding and feels like an uphill battle in each and every mission. So if you're someone who gives up easily, better look for something else to play. Monty Python's complete waste of time is anything but, or exactly that, depends how you wanna look at it. And it's also not a game, but in the same time it is. A series of few mini games. Okay, I know I must have confused you by now and you no doubt are questioning my sanity. And good, cause someone's gotta keep me in check and I can't count on Batman to do it. I'm Batman! Thank you Bruce for your priceless input. Anyway, the best way of describing Monty Python's complete waste of time would be calling it a multimedia CD chuck full of quirky, odd, hilarious and over-the-top content. The main menu is divided into six sections, depicted as the brain, in which each part of directs you to another set of content. There's clips from TV series, tons of really weird and Monty Python appropriate minigames and this can be anything from Whack-A-Mole clone, through medieval team pinball, to a peek in cowboy hat shooter, and others. There's also so-called Pythonizer, which under its cryptic name is basically a set of various Windows customizations like screen savers, live wallpapers incorporating minigames, static images, sounds, icons and more. While many of the clips available on CD are recordings of Monty Python's famous sketches, there's some original content too. If you're a fan of the British comedy troupe and their surrealistic sense of humor, or just someone who enjoys weird minigames, this is definitely a title to track down. Millennium Auction is an unusual one. Simply put, it's an auction simulator. And you have to find the best items to buy to be able to resell them later at increased price. Hopefully. So you have to pick a character at start from available few. It's a pity though that there's no option to create a custom one, but it is what it is. And then you're off to getting richer trading 135 unique treasures. Some are real and based on true items like Mona Lisa or Bill Clinton's sacks, others are completely made up. All of them however can be used to amass wealth. To do so you need to familiarize yourself with all the items on auctions, read up on them, talk with other bidders to see what they're interested in, check the newspaper and listen to radio to gather as much information as possible before deciding what to invest in. Millennium Auction is a very different title to most that came out in the early 90s and a true gem for those who like those easier, less in-depth but still fun economic strategies for up to 4 players. If you're into something more hardcore and requiring a lot of micromanagement or offering infinite replayability, better look somewhere else. Despite what it may look like compared to some games that we've covered in 1993's early Windows videos, National Lampoon's Blind Date, while being a dating simulator, is not cheap and idiotically written erotic title directed at horny teens. I mean it's still corny as hell and radiates cringe all over like a piece of enriched uranium, but at least this FMV game doesn't take itself too seriously. There's quite a few genuinely funny interactions to be had here, the leading actress is actually pretty good and would do much better for herself if she stuck to TV and movies medium, and overall the game does not feel like a waste of time. And not only because it takes just an hour or so to be. So you'll be mainly chatting up a young and gorgeous Sandy and based on your responses, certain actions depicted by short video sequences will be triggered. It's really hard to call National Lampoon's Blind Date a real game, even if technically it is one, but compared to other so-called dating simulators, it's much more fun and clearly not written by a 13 year old. All that said, I don't know about you, but neither Batman or I really need a video game to be turned down by beautiful women. At least he has money going for him. My lack of sanity is not really a marketable trait. Nightmare 3D is a horror-themed first-person shooter and a sequel to earlier Hugo games that we spoke about in the similar series to this but for DOS. And no, not the Hugo that was on TV and could be played by phoning into TV shows and pressing buttons on your landline in the 90s. The other one. Hugo's girlfriend has been kidnapped by the evil Dr. Hammerstein, who for whatever the reason intends to conduct experiments on her. Clearly he's some kind of educated perv. That is irrelevant however, cause since you, my dear viewer, are playing as Hugo, you do not, under any circumstances, are going to leave the poor girl in villain's hands. So you enter Hammerstein's mansion, then travel through a series of underground caves to eventually face him and save Hugo's love. Nightmare 3D plays like a slower, early FPS and even features some environmental puzzling. The levels are very flat, maze-like in their design and contain many hidden areas. So if you're someone who likes searching for secrets in your games, Nightmare 3D may be a title down your alley. There's only four weapons available in Nightmare 3D, Plasma Gun, Magic Wand, Pistol and Automatic Plasma Gun and it's good to familiarize yourself with them as they all work better or worse on specific enemies. Nightmare 3D is not a great game, it really isn't, but there are definitely worse ones you could be playing. 
Operation Inner Space is an arcade style shooter that takes place inside your computer. And I don't mean it like you are the player so it's your computer. I mean it literally. The game world is actually built up on launch and based on the contents of your hard drive. So you could say that it's to a certain degree randomized while also being customized for you and you only. Story-wise some kind of unknown mysterious evil forces have seized control of your system and are running rampart causing mayhem on your computer. So, you jump into a program ship to clear your device once and for all. You will need to round up all the renegade icons for your applications and defeat the AI controlled ones. You can treat inner space as a straight up shooter or approach it in a more strategic way forming alliances with various AI factions. Yes, you heard that right, there are AI factions within the game and they are not all your enemies. They can actually fight each other as well, so there is a delicate balance between many of the factions and it can actually change as the game progresses and as a result of your actions. And it's not often dramatic change, it can be very subtle and come back to bite you on your ass or save it when you least expect it. Operation Inner Space also features quite a few weapons to choose from, not all of them being entirely serious but most of them being very useful in one way or another. While you get to pick between various ships, if you don't particularly like any of them, you can design your own. AI opponents can even call you into the dueling arenas and if I'm to be honest, Operation Inner Space is probably one of if not the best or second best game in this entire video. Although there's one that's the obvious winner and it comes very soon after a couple more. Inner Space offers unprecedented and near infinite replayability, very solid fun and addictive gameplay and most of all it came on a single 3.5 inch diskette, which was nothing given how much content it serves. The simplest way of thinking about Outpost is that it's SimCity in space. As in the Earth was destroyed by a huge ass asteroid and you have to save what's left of us by building a colony in space and bringing prosperity to humanity once more. But that kind of comparison is unfavorable to both games as despite some similarities they do a lot of things entirely differently. When building a colony you not only have to make sure that there's enough resources for anything you plan for and anyone you take care of but also plan ahead for how you want to progress, expand and carry on with your settlement several turns ahead. There's a lot of different buildings you can erect and while it may seem a bit overwhelming at first since they all feel like basic necessities, you will have to learn to pick a route for your progress and stick to it. Each and every one of those buildings is unique and has their own benefits and you can even unlock more by researching new technologies. If you persevere and keep slowly working towards the best colony that there ever was, learning the ropes of the game and its controls, with time it will become not only a bit easier but also will make more sense and certain options will make themselves more apparent as better choices than others. So the initial confusion that plagues many new Outpost players may pass. Strong accent on May. Especially that the game is not only about buildings and research can also unlock new social policies, changes and texts that will make your colonists lives better. Graphics and sounds are excellent and probably one of the more polished for Windows 3.x. But Outpost is not without its faults. And aside from the lack of clear direction in early game, controls are an obvious culprit but not in the sense that the game is difficult to operate. No, what I mean is that it offers no help, no explanation and no way to clearly display and simplify data. And in the game where micromanagement is the king and often success and failure depend on a small number hidden somewhere on one of the subpages, it's criminal. Outpost is difficult. It's more demanding than SimCity and features arguably more content. But it's not a better game. It's not a bad one, but I wouldn't recommend it to anyone who's not a hardcore strategy slash management fan. Re-elect JFK is one of the most unusual games not only in 1994 but probably in all of gaming. I believe the title says it all, but in short it's a first person simulation with some adventuring elements where you play JFK under assumption that he survived the assassination attempt and your ultimate goal is to secure your re-election. The game takes 50 weeks leading towards 1964's election day and as you work towards this goal you'll be tackled with various close to life and era appropriate issues like war in Vietnam or civil rights movement. Most characters in real like JFK other than both Kennedy brothers are fictional but the political scene and dozens or hundreds even of situations that you can get yourself into and have to react upon or decide about makes it incredibly fun and replayable while not fake feeling game. The fact that the story is interesting and you can also quote unquote search for your failed assassin makes it even more captivating title that seems to have a story that you learn once upon completion if you manage to find him that is and infinitely replayable for the game's inner mechanics. So, all that should hopefully ignite your interest in real like JFK and if it didn't, it's cool too. It's a difficult game that was never designed to be for everyone. Pirates Gold for Windows is a direct port of DOS version and it's probably the very best outing of the game ever released other than the Amiga's original Pirates. 
It even superseded Amiga's gold version as it removed annoying and game flow interrupting requirement of walking around the town to enter various buildings. If I had to categorize it and put it in a labeled drawer corresponding to its genre, I'd say that I keep it in few of these little drawers, a copy in each. It's an RPG as you play as a titular pirate, pirate captain to be precise, and as time goes by you age, gain experience and better your skills while succumbing to debuffs that the age brings with it. Said experience and skills however are not based on numbers like in a typical RPG, but in you, in real life getting better at the game and its mechanics. In the same time it's also an adventure game, where you can be a ship captain helping to conquer Caribbean for one of four European powers, English, Dutch, Spanish or French, you can look for your long lost family members, hidden treasures and perform missions for governors of various islands. But you can also forfeit it all and just be a pirate living off of sinking and plundering other ships, raiding outposts big and small and capturing gold fleets or silver trains for unimaginable riches. So, and this may already be quite obvious, it's also a life simulation. A very specific life, one full of grog hangovers, chopped off limbs and sword duels, but a life simulation nonetheless. If you haven't had a chance to experience it, don't worry about it, pause this video, grab your parrot, grab a barrel of best slash strongest grog and lock yourself away for the weekend to jump straight into this amazing swashbuckling adventure. If you'd like to know more about it, there is a whole separate video review of Pirates on this very channel. It tackles the standard version for the Amiga, but other than the refreshed graphics and added in-game map, Windows version is identical to it content-wise. King's Quest VII The Princeless Bride for Windows is the very same game that it was for DOS. And no wonder, it's just a mere port. And as early Windows 3.x games go, adventure titles are the best case conversion scenarios as there's not much fast-paced action in them and the platform can handle them decently. Anyway, Princeless Bride is a point-and-click adventure with beautiful SVGA presentation and the seventh part of ongoing King's Quest series of games. By a set of unfortunate events, Queen Valanis of Daventry and her daughter Princess Rosella are transferred to another world, ending up in two different parts of the land known as Eldridge. In the process, Princess Rosella is unfortunately transformed into a troll. They must find each other and eventually defeat the evil sorceress who plots to ruin the kingdom. Unlike in previous games, icon-based interface is dropped in favor of smart cursor that clicks off are used for interaction with all characters, objects and environment. The game is divided into chapters, alternating between the queen and princess as protagonists. King's Quest VII is a pretty darn good game with incredible cartoon-like presentation, especially if you're a fan of either Roberta Williams or adventure titles in general. In 1994 Windows got two versions of SimCity 2000. First was a base game that released a year earlier for DOS and second the so-called CD Collection version that featured great disaster scenario pack, urban renewal kit that allowed for editing of city and objects and additional bonus cities and scenarios for the base release. But what SimCity 2000 is actually? It's a sequel to original SimCity and as the title suggests a city building simulation. It was also the very best version of SimCity until SimCity 4 which released many years later. Some believe that it's the very best overall, but I suppose it's down to personal preferences. Anyway, it's a much improved title when compared to original as it was hugely expanded and improved upon, both in terms of substance and presentation. The game is played from an isometric top-down perspective and features beautiful, extremely detailed graphics, very memorable and atmospheric even if only MIDI-based soundtrack. Gameplay-wise, SimCity 2000 is so expanded that it can be considered entirely different game. Underground map was added, for water pipes and subway lines there are numerous new building types like prisons, schools, libraries, museums, marinas, hospitals and archaeologies, that last one being sort of modern ecological near self-sustained city within a city. You can build highways, bus and train depots, railway tracks, seaports and airports. And there are nine differently specced and working power plants. Most of them have a pre-assigned average lifespan and either need to be rebuilt when said lifespan ends or you'll risk future possible explosion, fire or meltdown. One of the biggest changes, however, are the city ordinances, which allow for setting up certain rules or laws, if you will, that your city will follow, and in turn they offer a slew of various benefits. To summarize, SimCity 2000 allows you to build and expand your city from ground up, connect it to its neighbors, and watch it grow to become the metropolis of its inhabitants' dreams. And you're responsible for everything – budget, planning, expansions and damage control in case of any of the possible disasters. It's a game that stole hundreds if not thousands of hours from my life, as even today whenever I launch it for whatever the reason, be it a video or just because, I can't help myself and end up playing it for hours on end. But you know what? Not a single one of those hours feels wasted. The Chaos Continuum is a first-person sci-fi adventure game. It's 2577 and humanity has long colonized space by building bases all over. One of these, the one on Titan, had suddenly and mysteriously all of its inhabitants disappear. 
The station seems all but alive and only few lone automated robots walk around the halls as if nothing had ever happened. It's impossible to tell what occurred within as the sentient computer controlling the station called Chaos is resisting any connection attempts from outside. So the name fits the bill. To learn of on the on-site happenings you must take the so-called EVA time pod and shift through interdimensional rifts to get to the station and eventually find the reason for its going dark. So you'll be using probes interfaces, searching through on-site databases and computers looking for any feasible explanation. Most of the game is built around FMV pre-rendered sequences, so while it may not feature as many actors as other games in the genre did, it suffers from same issues. If you're a hardcore fan of adventure games or for whatever reason are drawn to FMV titles, Chaos Continuum is something you should try. Otherwise feel free to skip it as it's not really a paragon of fun and involving gameplay. And there are many other better games you could be investing your time in. The Incredible Tune Machine is a follow-up to earlier Sid and Al's Incredible Tunes that we spoke about in earlier videos. For all intents and purposes, it's the same game mechanically, requiring you to solve increasingly more difficult mechanical puzzles, but it's enriched by a whole range of new in-puzzle animations, adding a lot to the fun factor of gameplay. There's also 130 entirely new, even more challenging levels to beat, and a set of 71 different gadgets to use to complete the stages. If you're someone who likes puzzle games, especially those that require thinking out of the box and often dropping logic in favor of creative approach to solving riddles, you'll love it. And since the game is beautiful, with cartoon-like characters all over, it can be played by kids too, at least in the early easier levels. The Page Master is a point-and-click adventure game based on a classic animated movie of the same title. You play as Richard, a young boy who was protagonist in the movie and you're sent back to the library world because the titular Page Master has been kidnapped by Mr. Hyde, so you need to help your friends adventure, fantasy and horror by traveling to their domains and setting things that were changed right, and in the process rescuing the Page Master. The graphics are very cartoon-like, both in their design and quality, and many interactions trigger animation sequences that are very reminiscent in those in the movie. Grand majority of the puzzles are inventory based and many of the clues on how to solve them can be found in the game world as text excerpts from classic works of fiction. That said, many of the puzzles can be skipped or have more than one solution, henceforth it is clear from the get-go that Page Master was intended for younger audiences, to spark their interest in books and reading, and was not made to keep older players interested. Its riddles are usually simpler than in other games in the genre, there's no death whatsoever and no mistakes lead to a halt in progress. It's a fun title for kids or parents who'd want to spend quality time with them and also play a game. The Psychotron is a first-person perspective FMV adventure game, and it's not a great one, I'm afraid. Unless you like cheesy acting over the top plot and ridiculous puzzles. Story-wise, you're a CIA agent trying to find and recover a mind-control device that US purchased from Russia and lost in transit when the plane carrying it crashed. The puzzles and gameplay are not the best and most quote-unquote fun comes from interviewing witnesses, who act as if they midlife decided that they want to become actors and that they're gonna approach their roles as over the top as they can, treating every situation like a life and death scenario. It's hilarious. So if you are someone who can find fun in cringe, there's a lot of it here. Other than that, Psychotron's interactivity is similar to one you'll have playing with a potato. Sure, you can watch it from all sides and prod it here and there, but that's pretty much it. You will never take anything more out of it than it's apparent at first glance. And Psychotron is only here because for me it's close in its quality to my beloved Sharknado series of movies. Now, you may wonder why I called most likely the worst series of films ever created as beloved, and if you've not been viewer of this channel for a while, let me explain. They are awfully bad terribly acted and feature as bad, shallow and unremarkable plot as it's possible. And that's what's great about them. Cause they cross that invisible line between a big stinking fly covered log of dog shit and the thing that's so incredibly stupid that it becomes hilarious. Trivial Pursuit interactive multimedia game, despite having one of the longest titles in 1994, is just a computer version of Parker Brothers' classic board game Trivial Pursuit. It features a lot of photos, animations, voice clips and videos to serve over 2000 built-in questions and answers following the rules of original game. So up to 6 players can play it, rolling the dice and moving their pieces around the game board. The fields on it are color-coded and contain random questions from one of 6 trivia categories. People and places, sports and leisure, history, arts and entertainment, science and nature and a wild card. Correct answers grant the player an additional turn. If right answers are given at special prize fields, however, a player receives a colored pie piece. Collecting all six and then heading back to the center hub for a final question wins the game. If said question is answered correctly, that is. While the rules of Trivial Pursuit alone are very simple, the questions vary considerably and can be as well very basic as extremely difficult. 
I love trivia games and playing them with others and I do it to this very day, both in tabletop board format or on modern consoles. But this original 1994 release is also excellent, even if the 2000 plus included questions is not as many as I'd like to see in my quiz game. There was a time when everyone watched Wheel of Fortune. People gathered around in their living rooms watching it together, guessing puzzles along with TV contestants and hoping that their favorites would spin well to get the best prices. Yes, it was in the time when people actually used to watch TV. And Wheel of Fortune for Windows is actually an excellent version of the game. It features real Vanna White in full motion video digitized to also host the show. The game features over 5000 different words and sentences and up to 3 real or CPU controlled players can participate. The rules of the game are identical to the TV show and fun if you liked it. You can't however skip any of the cutscenes and they get old real soon. You can turn them off altogether, but then Wheel of Fortune is just a glorified game of hangman. To summarize, if you for whatever reason still love Wheel of Fortune, it's your kind of a game. For others, I feel that it's a title that could be skipped when released and can definitely be skipped today. And with this video we're closing 1994. While not the best year for Windows gaming, it was definitely a much more interesting one than 1993 was. And a good starting point to 1995, which thanks to release of Windows 95 and first version of DirectX, will allow for more better games on the system. What do you think though? Any of the titles seemed particularly interesting? Or maybe you're waiting for a game that released in 1995 or later? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video hit those like and subscribe buttons below, if you didn't, well then there's thumbs down there too. But I suppose you wouldn't have persevered up to this point if you really didn't. Around 60% of you are not subscribed and there's currently no way of knowing if YouTube will decide to recommend you the next episode or not, other than subscribing and hitting that bell that is. And when you hit that bell, whenever the new video is out, YouTube will actually send you a small and friendly notification about it, so you wouldn't miss it. If you'd like to support the channel, Patreon and YouTube memberships are a great way of doing so, they will help me release better content and also they get first dips on all new videos before they're publicly accessible on YouTube. If you can't or don't want to do that though, likes and subscribes are great too. I would like to take a moment here and thank all the YouTube creators from whose videos short bits were taken to serve as a background to my commentary. They're amazing and stars among the retro community. You will find names of their channels at the top of the screen when their footage is running and also in the video description below. For me though, this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.